بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله Peace be upon you, O Gharib, O Shaheed, O Madloom of Karbala. May Allah grant us in this dunya his ziyarah, and in the next life his shafa'ah. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We all wish to be parents one day if we already aren't. We all wish to have children that make us proud, that carry our name and our lineage. The Holy Quran speaks about this concern that many prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had. The Quran shows us that their dua, the dua of the prophets was to ask for children. For example, Allah gives us the story of Prophet Zakariya. Allah says that Zakariya said, هُنَالِكَ دَعَى زَكَرِيَّا رَبَّهُ فَقَالَ رَبِّ هَبْ لِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ ذُرِّيَّةً طَيِّبَةً إِنَّكَ سَمِيعُ الدُّعَى He said, Oh Allah, I ask you to give me children, good children, good offspring. إِنَّكَ سَمِيعُ الدُّعَى InshaAllah, you answer my dua. And then another verse says, وَزَكَرِيَّا إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ رَبِّ لَا تَذَرْنِ فَرْدًا وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الْوَارِثِينَ Zakariya said, Oh Allah, do not leave me alone. Do not leave me by myself. Give me good children. Zakariya did not have a child until late in his life he had Yahya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a child. Likewise, Ibrahim, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for children. He said, Rabbi Habli min as Oh Allah, give me good, noble, pious children. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him Ishaq and Ismail, even though he was old and his wife was old. It was a miracle. And that's why when Allah gave him Ismail and Ishaq, he said, Alhamdulillah, alladhi wahaba li ala al kibari Ismail wa Ishaq. Inna Rabbi la sami'u dua. I thank Allah and praise him that he gave me Ishaq and he gave me. Ismail. After Allah gave Ibrahim these two children, he asked for the most important things for his children. Once we have children, we want our children to be successful. We want certain things for our children. What was the most important area of concern for Ibrahim regarding his children? He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that verse. He says, Rabbi, he thanks Allah that he gave him the two children. And then he says, Rabbi j'alni muqeem as-salah wa min dhurriyyati. Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. He says, my Lord, make me keep up prayer, maintain prayer. And then he does the same dua for his kids. And for my offspring, make them maintain prayer and keep up prayer. So it's not enough that I pray. I want my children to pray. This was very important to Ibrahim. In another verse, Ibrahim says, رَبَّنَا وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ After they built the Kaaba, he and Ismail, he made this dua. He said, Ya Allah, and make us, me and my son, both submissive to you. So not just me, I want my son to submit to you. And raise from our offspring a nation, an entire nation submitting to you. So this was very important to Ibrahim that he, his children, his grandchildren, all of his lineage, they're all submitters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran tells us that the dua of the believers, a believer does this dua towards his children. And the believers, they say, oh Allah, give us good children, children that make us peaceful, Children that give us joy, that give us comfort, they have iman, they have taqwa, and thus we can sleep beautifully at night. We don't want children that give us problems in our lives. 
So as you notice, the dua of Zakaria, the dua of Ibrahim, the dua of the believers towards children is all focused on them being faithful and submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is not one dua in the Quran where the prophets or the believers say, oh Allah, make our children rich, for example. Make them, for example, wealthy. Make them successful in this dunya. Now don't get me wrong, these are good things. We should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our children to be successful, to be wealthy, to be healthy, live a long life. But this was not the area of concern of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their priority was faith, was religion. Now, when we come to our communities and we come to parents today, we notice that the priorities have changed, unfortunately. What matters to parents today, the area of concern to parents is what? Their children's health, their children's education, and their children's career. This is the most important thing to them. They will spend and invest so much on these things, on their health, if they have a cavity, even if they'll spend $5,000. This is my child. I spend on them. And like I said, this is good. I'm not saying this is bad. This is all good. They st parents today strive to make sure that they provide everything. All the materialistic needs, whatever the child, the boy, the, the girl needs, they buy it for them. And that's also good. There's nothing wrong in that. But unfortunately, when it comes to their children's faith and piety, the level of concern that you find isn't at par with health and, and their education and their and uh, their career and the you know the the greatest testimony to that that we don't care about our children's faith as much as we do about other things about their education and career the greatest testimonies take this example I as a parent would I ever tolerate my child skipping school one day oh, they don't want to go to school why I don't want to uh, I don't find school beneficial will you buy that will you accept that or no you're going to force and pressure your child you have to go to school you're going to make a big deal out of it right but unfortunately so many parents are okay if their children skip prayers they don't pray salat al subh they don't pray salat al dhuhr maghrib many prayers they're okay with that they're not going to make a big deal out of that why that shows that this is not a priority to them in their lives towards their children if take this example, if a girl decides not to wear hijab, she's 12, 13. I don't like hijab, father. I've seen many parents, pious parents, they tell me, Sayyid, we don't want to force our kids, my our daughters, to wear hijab. If she's not convinced wearing hijab, then I'm not gonna force her. Right? You know what I tell those parents? I tell them, fine, you don't want to force them because you, force is useless then what if one day your daughter comes and she wants to drop out of high school? She wants to drop out of college. She has a health issue that she says, you know what, I'm not convinced that I have to care for this health issue. Will you ever allow that? Never, brothers and sisters, we will allow that. We will go, we will do anything we can, go to the fullest extent to try to pressure our kids. No, you're gonna destroy your life if you do that, if you don't go to school, if you don't get a job, if you don't get a degree. But when she doesn't want to wear hijab, when he doesn't want to pray, when he finds there's no problem in committing this sin and that sin, and we don't find it as a big deal, this shows where my priorities are. Faith is not a priority to many of us. Yes, it's important, but it's not a big priority. And this is one of the greatest injustices that we do when we raise our children. And that's why when we speak about the rights that our children have against us, remember our last topic, was the rights that our parents have against us. And the same way that parents have rights, our children also have rights. And thus the first right that your child has against you is that you raise your child in an Islamic atmosphere. You raise your child and you teach them faith, you teach them religion, you teach them Iman, you raise them as practicing Muslims. This is one of the rights of your children. It's a right. You, it's, you don't have a choice to ask them if they want it or not. No, you have to, you have to uh, place it in the, in the uh, system and the procedure and the process that you have of raising children, whether they like it or not, because it's a right. It's a right that they must be given.
And I have to raise them in a way in which they understand the teachings. They understand the rituals and they accept them. I always say, if I have to force my daughter to wear hijab, that means I have failed in raising her the right way. If I have to force my son to pray, there was somewhere where I went wrong. You don't have to force them. If you successfully raise them the right way, they should be in a, in a state where they willingly, willfully accept all these rituals. They willfully accept the teachings. And if they shouldn't, and if they don't care about that, I shouldn't be okay with it. You see, this is what, what I want to, uh, the, the point that I want to deliver. We don't always have control. We can't use force. But the point is, if my child doesn't want, care about religion, I should not be okay with that. This is one of the rights of my children, that I make religion and faith a priority in their lives. And especially the hadith tell us prayer. Listen to this hadith from Imam al-Sadiq. He says, He says that we, Ahlul Bayt, when our children are five years old, we start to teach them salah and we order them to maintain salah all the time so that once, once they're nine or 15, whenever they become mature, they have learned it. It has become a habit, a part of their life. And that's why the imam says, you, our Shia, you don't have to start at five, but at least start at seven. When they are seven years old, make sure salah is an integral, important part of their life. And like I said, do it in a way in which they love salah, a way in which they willfully accept salah. Now you may ask me, is that easy? Of course it's not easy. No one said raising good children is going to be easy, my friends. And that's why Imam Zain al-Abideen himself says this. He says in Sahifa Sajadiyah, he has a beautiful dua. Read it. Read it. The meanings of this dua, the words are beautiful. Ponder upon it. It's not just an invocation, a dua that we read. No, there's so many lessons in it. The Imam says these words. He says, I ask you, Ya Allah, to help me in the struggle of raising my children and and disciplining them. And then he says, وَبِرْهِمْ And paying my duties and my rights towards them. So I have rights that I must pay. There are certain obligations towards my child. I have to keep them. I ask you, Ya Allah, to help me in making sure that I raise a good child. Because it's not easy and we have to realize that. Brothers and sisters, if you have the mindset that raising kids it's easy, inshallah, they'll all be religious just like how I was. Trust me, most likely you're going to fail in raising your children. Why? Because we live in a new society, my friends. We live in a society, a Western society that doesn't believe in the values that we, our parents instilled in us. It's a liberal society. And that's why when you're trying to raise your child the right way, you have to swim against a powerful wave, a powerful liberal wave. So the tides are against you. The odds are against you. There is no such thing as morality, unfortunately, anymore in these societies. The concept of haya is long gone. You know, in this society, the Western society, it is expected, it is now expected that a girl starts dating when she's 12, that a boy starts dating when he's 11 and 12. And I spoke about that in my first lecture. If I did not instill the Islamic values that are absent in the society today, my children will be lost. Now, I know what some of you are saying when you're listening to this lecture. Yes, Sayyid, we know all of this. We've heard it many times. We know that we have to raise our children in Islamic way. This is important. We know all of this. And that's why... You know, we don't, have, we don't need to necessarily hear it. No, my friends, this is wrong. I know that you've heard this and you know it, but we constantly read, need reminders. The Quran tells the Prophet, فَذَكِّرْ You always, in the dhikra تَنْفَعَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Always remind people of things they know, but just because you know doesn't mean you're going to do it. Doesn't, gonna be, you're gonna, doesn't mean you're going to put it into actions and teachings. So we constantly read, need reminders, my friends. You don't know how many stories I've heard of what children are doing nowadays behind the backs of their parents, pious parents, good parents, but what their children are doing, the drugs that they're taking, drinking, unfortunately, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, and the father, what really breaks your heart is 
that the father is so religious, he's so holy, he's so he's practicing, he's so pious, he's so righteous, but he has this child. I remember when I was in public school in the U.S., I used to go to Friday prayer and I used to go to the public school. I knew one of the children, one of the uh, classmates in the school, and I knew his father also. I would see him in Salatul Jum'ah, of course, without his son. I would see his son in school. The father was the best individual, the first person that comes, opens the door of the masjid. He reads the du'as between the prayers. So holy, you can see the nur in his face. But come and see what his son does in school. Allahu Akbar. Things I can't mention to you. I can't even tell you the level of corruption and immorality. He had so many girlfriends and the drugs and this and that. And I used to say only if the father knew what his son is doing. Only if the, but did the father bring, wallahi, I think I tended the entire year, Salatul Jum'ah, not once did he bring his son to Salatul Jum'ah. His son is in a completely different world and he's in a different, what's the point? If you are a righteous individual, but your child is lost because he didn't really care, he didn't invest as much as you invest in your children, you'll see the result. If you're busy investing in your business, your business will flourish, not your child. So why is it with our businesses we have to spend so much time? Or with our children? No, we want the Saturday school to teach them. We want the, you know, the Islamic school. We want the Maulana to come and teach them. I don't think so. Yes, we can help. But the majority, 99% of the burden is on the parents. I know a father, brothers and sisters, who is a righteous individual. His son is an atheist here in the West. I know another father who's also righteous, prays Salat al-Layl, namaz al -shab. His son is a Christian. Why? Because when he was so focused on himself, he lost his son. And this is a struggle and a challenge that many parents are not even aware of. And that's why they lose their children, unfortunately. So thus, the first right that our children have is we have to teach them, we have to be involved in their lives so that we prevent our children from being lost. This is the first right that our children have against us. Right number two, according to the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. The Imams tell us that one of the rights of your children is to give them beautiful names. Choose beautiful names when you have a child, when you have a boy that is born, when you have a girl that is born. The Holy Prophet says, One of the rights that your child has is that you give them a beautiful name. And the most beautiful names, brothers and sisters, are the names of Ahlul Bayt Can you find names that are better than the names of Ahlul Bayt? I see some people, they name their children after cultural names. They have no significance in Islam. Now, is that haram? No. But why leave the names of Ahlul Bayt, of Rasulullah, and name them after a flower, after a rose, after you know, a cultural name? Why do that when you have the names of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam brothers and sisters? Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein. There's a hadith from Rasulullah where he says, if you have four children and you don't name any of them after me, after Rasulullah, faqad jafani, then you have neglected me, you have disrespected me, you have not paid your respect to Rasulullah. You had four kids, not even one you named Muhammad or one of the other Titles of Rasulullah like Mustafa, for example, at least one, or Ahmed, for example. These are all names of Rasulullah. So the most beautiful names that we should make, you know, we should try our best that we, we don't name our kids, but after Ahlul Bayt, because we love Ahlul Bayt. There are role models and their names are the best of names. You know, some people, they object. They say, well, you know what? When I look in my community, there's too many Ali's. If I name my son Ali, it's not going to be a unique name. I want a unique name. There's too many Fatimas. There's too many Hassans. There's too many Husseins. I want a unique name. That's why I'll name my daughter, for example, Sarah. I'll name uh, my son this or that. I don't want to give examples. Uh, sometimes it gets personal. But the point is the most beautiful names are Ahl al-Bayt. And we can never have too much Ali's. Listen to this to this hadith, to this story, if you think there's too many Ali's in the community. During the time of Muawiyah, Al-Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam went to meet Marwan ibn al-Hakam. He was in Medina. 
and he was the governor. So he went to meet Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan asked him, what's your name? Imam Zain al-Abidin's name is Ali. He told him, my name is Ali. So apparently Marwan ibn al-Hakam knew Ali ibn al-Akbar. So he told him, then what's your brother's name, your older brother? He said, my older brother's name is also Ali. He said, what? Your father, he started to mock in Imam al Hussein. Your father didn't find any other name but Ali, Ali, two brothers, and you're both Ali. What is this? So Imam Zain al Abidin, the hadith says, he went back to his father, Imam al Hussein, and he told him of the story. He mocked the fact that you named me and my brother Ali al Akbar both Ali. You know what Imam al Hussein said? Al Imam al Hussein said, Wallahi, if I had 100 children, I would love to name all of them Ali. You see, Imam Hussein had, had Ali al Akbar, the oldest Ali. Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin, the middle, middle one, and Ali al Azgar, the small Ali. All his children were named Ali, the boys. He says, if I had 100 children, I would name all of them Ali. There is no name that is more beautiful than Ali. So, this is the second right of your children. Give them beautiful names, names that they are proud of when they are old. That's number two. Number three, the hadith tell us one of the rights that our children have is that if you promise that you will buy them something or give them something or take them somewhere, do anything for them, try your best to not break your promise. Now, a question that rises here, is it haram to break your promise or not? Not just with your kids, just in general, with anyone. Scholars mention that when you make the promise, if your intention was to try your best to keep the promise, but then you couldn't keep your promise due to some unforeseen circumstances, then it's not haram to break it. I promised someone that I'll come and meet him. All of a sudden I got sick. All of a sudden I got busy. I couldn't. I can break my promise. But however, they do state that if when you made the promise, your intention was, I'm not going to do it. Some people, they make a fake promise. Yes, and they know even that they're not going to try to keep that promise. Many scholars mention this is haram. Because this is a form of lie. Yes, I'm going to come and you're not even intending. Versus I really wanted to come, but then I couldn't. So with your children, it becomes even more important. The hadith of Rasulullah says, إِذَا وَعَدْتُمُوهُمْ شَيْئًا فَفُولَهُمْ He says, if you promise your children something, then give them what they want it. فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يَرَوْنَ إِلَّا أَنَّكُمْ تَرْزُقُونَهُمْ Because they see you, the parent, as the sustainer, the caregiver, the caretaker. In the same way, that we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's our sustainer. And when he, does, when he doesn't give us what we want, you know, we're so upset because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my sustainer. If He doesn't give me, who do I turn to? This is how our kids see us. That th their parents give them everything. If their parents don't give them what they wanted, they are upset and they think, who should I turn to now if my parent didn't give me what I wanted? If my parent breaks their promise, that leaves such a bad example towards my child. So this is right number three. Right number four that our children have against us, the ahadith tell us that if you have more than one child, treat all of your children equally. Don't treat any one of them better than the other. Don't favor any one of them more than the other. Even though one of them may be special, may be better than the others, but in your treatment, Make sure that you treat them equally. Why? It's obvious. Because when you, try, when you start treating one child better than the other, this creates animosity between them. The other one who's not favored, who's not getting the special treatment, is going to start to become envious. He's going to start to hate his siblings. The same thing that happened in the story of Prophet Yusuf when Yaqub favored. Now, it's not haram to favor, of course. Yaqub favored his son Yusuf because Yusuf was going to be a prophet. But however... What did that cause? That caused this fact that his brothers became envious and then they tried to kill him in the entire story of Prophet Yusuf. And that's why there's a hadith from Imam al-Baqir It's interesting where he says that I have many kids. Of course, not all of them are equal. Some are good, some aren't as, as that good. He says, but I treat all of them equally. Even the ones that aren't special, he says that I play with them, I bring them, I put them on my lap, I show them so much love, and I do everything for them, even though they don't deserve all of that. Because there's other children that are much greater, like, 
like who? Like Al Imam Sadiq, for example, the son of Imam Baqir. He should receive special treatment because he was a special person. But no, the Imam says, I don't do that. Why? He says, He says, because I don't want what happened to Yusuf to happen to my children, the sons of Yaqub. So this is the third or the fourth right our children have against us. Treat them all equally. Number five, the fifth right that our children have against us is when it comes to the age of marriage and they want to get married, give your child room to choose their spouse. Allow them to choose their spouse, the one that they love, as long as the individual that they're choosing is pious. He's a believer. She's a believer. They're practicing Muslims. That's enough. You see, many times young individuals, they come and tell me, that my father doesn't allow me to get married to this girl, or a girl tells me my father doesn't allow me to marry that guy just because he's from another culture. I ask him, well, is it because that guy drinks? No. Is it because, for example, he gambles? No. Is it because he doesn't pray? He doesn't, he's not religious? No, 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 no. Because I'm an Arab and he's Persian and he's Indian. Because I'm Pakistani and that person, that young individual is Afghan. Unfortunately, brothers and system, this racism that we have, this is very un-Islamic. Not only is it un-Islamic, but I'm ruining my child's life when I do that. You know, you don't know how many times parents themselves, they come to me and they tell me, they ask me to persuade their son or their daughter not to marry that individual. Why? Not because they have any issues, reservations, concerns with the person's piety or his manners and akhlaq and behavior. No, because of the culture. I remember a mother came to me and he told, and she told me she drove an hour from another city in the U.S. just to tell me, say it, talk to my daughter. I don't want her to marry that young man. Why? Because he's from another culture. Now, what am I supposed to say? This is so un-Islamic. Not only are you doing it, you want me to help you in this oppression and this injustice. I remember another situation where there was a young man that wants to marry another girl, but then it broke apart. It didn't happen. So I spoke to the father a while after. I asked him, what happened? He told me, say it. I intervened and I broke it. I said, why? He says, because the girl is good, but her family isn't good. And I didn't want to deal with the family. This is haram, brothers and sisters. When we deprive our children marriage for these silly reasons, as long as they're good individuals, as long as they're pious, they're righteous people, that's enough. Any other condition you put isn't going to serve anyone, isn't going to serve your child. We're just being selfish. You know, I know, you know, I remember a father that once told me that I want you to convince my son to accept, you know, marrying this girl. So I asked him why, what's special about this girl? He says, because I'm friends with that girl's father. He's a very good man. He's a scholar. And I know that if my son marries her, I will become closer to the scholar. How selfish is that, brothers and sisters, that we use our son, our child, our, my son, my daughter, and I use their marriage for my personal interest because I want to seek nearness to it. Even though he's a scholar, it's not anything bad, but I can't use my child as a scapegoat because at the end of the day, it's your son that will live with that girl, not you. If he doesn't love her, then what's the point? The marriage will fall apart. That's why there's no point in, and there's no point in pressuring someone to marry. Don't pressure your son. Don't pressure your daughter because if they don't love that individual, most of the times, all that will do is it will lead to divorce a few months down the line. Is that what you want? Even if you have a good son and daughter, they say, okay, dad, I'll do it for you. Okay, mom, I'll do it for you. But at the end, in a couple of months, if they don't like, there's no connection, there's no chemistry, it's going to fall apart. So we're only ruining the marriages of our children. We pressure them. And you know, there's a story about this, a hadith. One of the companions of Imam al-Sadiq by the name of Ibn Abi Ya'far, he had this problem. He comes to Imam al-Sadiq and he tells him, I want to marry this girl, but my parents are insisting I marry another one and I don't want her. What, what do I do? I don't want to upset my parents, but I don't want to live with a girl that I don't love and maybe I'll... Uh, be you know this is injustice towards her I won't show her the love that she deserves and respects so the imam alayhi salam tells him these sentences these words the imam tells him tazawwaj allati hawait wada allati yahwa 
He says, no, marry the one that you want. As long as, of course, we have the general hadith, they're pious, they're, there's iman, then marry the one that you want and leave the ones that your parents want. When the imam says that, my friends, when he says, marry the one that you love, that you want, not the ones that your parents want you to marry, the imam is sending a message to all parents. And he's saying this, if your son, your daughter doesn't want to marry someone, don't pressure them, don't force them. Leave marriage up to your son. Unless your son comes and asks, father, find me a wife. Mother, find me a girl. Fine. But don't intervene and force them, my friends, or pressure them. Because all you will do is you'll get them to commit to a failed marriage, a doomed marriage that will just lead to divorce and problems later. Yes, you know, we, our children have to obey us. That's right. And a good child, a grateful child is the one that listens to their uh, parents and they obey their parents. But at the same time, don't destroy, destroy your child's life. Just because I, you know, I want my child to be good and listen to me, I destroy their lives. Don't force your children to turn against you, brothers and sisters. Don't force them to defy you. When your expectations are too high, when you're too demanding, you're going to force them to turn against you, to disobey you. Help your children in being good children, in being grateful children. Why? By not involving yourselves too much. Don't involve yourself. Some parents, every day they have to know what this, the married son did, where they traveled. The more you involve yourself, the more you make it difficult upon your child to obey you, to be nice with you, to be good with you. Allow them to make decisions. Give them room. Give them space. Only interfere when it is necessary. When you see it is necessary or when they ask. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, Rahimallahu walidayni a'ana waladahuma ala birrihima. He says, may Allah have mercy. Great are the parents that help their son or their daughter in being grateful. Meaning you help them in obeying you. How? By giving them room, not giving them too much. When you give them too much, it's you that will lead them to being ungrateful. It's you that will lead them to abandoning you. So try your best to help them in being good children. By being easy with them. By not being so high demanding and high maintenance with them. So this is the fifth right that our children have against us. Give them room when it comes to marriage. And finally, number six, when they are married, when my son has a spouse, has a wife, when my daughter has a husband, help them. One of their rights is to help them. Try your best so that you give them so that they keep a good relationship with their spouse. You see, some unfortunately, some parents, they turn their own children against their spouses. And you usually find that between the mother-in-law, the never-ending battle and feud between the mother-in-law, the, the boy's father, and the daughter-in-law and the wife. Unfortunately, there's a constant feud, constant competition between the mother-in-law and the wife. And so many stories, I can give you 50 stories of how many problems I've heard between the mother-in-law and uh, the daughter-in-law. And how the relationship can get so toxic, toxic at times. And unfortunately, unfortunately, sometimes the mother tries, because she doesn't like the daughter-in-law, she tries to use her son against his wife. She tries to turn her own son against his wife. And she tries to plant problems, animosity between them. She tries to make up things against the wife. Brothers and sisters, you know what that will lead to? What that will lead to is the husband, because he wants to listen to his mother and love her and respect her. He starts to neglecting his wife. He starts yelling at her. He starts hating her. He starts oppressing her, doing volume towards her because of all all the, the, you know, the, the sick ideas, the poison that his mother is putting in his mind, unfortunately. And by doing that, the, what the mothers and the fathers need to know, by, when, even if the girl is bad, but when you, turn, when you turn your son against his wife or your daughter against her husband, you're destroying your own child's life because her life is with her husband. His life is with his wife. So when you turn him against her, you're destroying your own son's life. 
And that's why, brothers and sisters, if my mother ever tries to turn me against my wife, don't listen to your mother. Don't listen to her. Just because she's my mother, I'm going to go and I will change against my wife. This is haram, brothers and sisters. This is haram. I have to always respect my wife. I have to give her her rights. Just because my mother tells me to oppress her, that does not justify. The hadith says, لا طاعة لمخلوق على معصية الخالق. You cannot obey anyone when it comes to haram. I don't care even if my mother said it. Even if my mother said it, haram is haram. I cannot oppress my wife just to please my mother. But at the same time, at the same time, don't disrespect your mother. Respect your mother. Don't rebuke her. Even if she's wrong in this feud, in this battle, don't rebuke her. Don't yell at her. Tell her nicely. Mother, I can't. I'm sorry. You're being biased. Tell her in a nice way. So you can take a middle course where at the same time that you don't listen to your mother, but you can also respect her. And this is exactly what the Quran says. The Quran says, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا The Holy Quran says, and if your parents, they pressure you to do shirk, ascribe a partner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, don't listen to them. Of course, you can't listen to them and go and worship an idol. But at the same time, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا But be nice to them. Be be very, very nice and respectful with them. But tell them, I'm sorry, I cannot. So what I have to do is I have to try to keep a balance between respecting and serving my parents and at the same time respecting my wife and spending time with her. You can keep a balance. They can fight all they want. You don't have to choose sides. This is what I'm trying to say. I've seen so many instances, people that I know sometimes related to the never-ending feud between the in-laws and the wife or between the husband and the in-laws. You don't have to be have to choose sides. Respect both of them at the same time. Respect the parents and respect the wife and respect the spouse. So at the same time, my friends, that you shouldn't allow your parents to turn you against your spouse, at the same time, you should not allow your spouse to turn you against your parents. You see, I have to be fair here. Sometimes, and I've heard many stories, Sometimes I've seen certain husbands that they turn against their own parents, against his own mother, just because his wife keeps on complaining, keeps on putting these ideas in his head. This is haram, brothers and sisters. This is haram. Don't let your wife, how many mothers do you have? You just have one mother that raised you, that carried you in her womb for nine months. You only have one father, brothers and sisters. Never allow your spouse to turn you against your parents. Your parents, as I mentioned in the last sermon, are the most cherished human beings you have in your life. And that's why I say, try, try your best to strike a balance. Respect both of them. You don't have to choose sides. But however, sometimes there's a conflict and you have to choose sides. Sometimes you have to choose one over the other. If there is a conflict and you don't know which side to choose because each one has their own, sometimes it's clear one is doing volum to the other. Sometimes you don't know. They're just fighting and you don't know which side you have to choose. You can't stay, for example, neutral. And obviously, my brothers and sisters, you have to choose your parents. I mean, this is common sense. Your parents and your spouse, which is more important? Obviously, it's your parents. The prophet says that Jannah, paradise, is beneath the feet of your mother, not your wife. The ahadith tell us that you can never repay your parents and try your best to, to serve them. Not your wife, even though your wife, of course, is good. Not your husband. So the point is, try your best to fulfill your obligations and duties towards both of them. But if there is a time where you have to choose sides, you have to be with your parents. You have to be with your mother, brother and sister, because this is the mother that carried you in her womb. Now remember, do not do dhulam against your wife. Dhulam is always haram, like we mentioned. Don't listen to your mother in the volume, but always respect her. You know, there's a saying that goes, if you're late one night, you don't come back home until it's very late. Your mother is waiting for you, but your mother automatically thinks worst case scenario. What happened to my son? Did he get into a car accident? Is he caught up somewhere and he needs help? This is the compassion of the mother, right? But usually, now this is obviously, this is mentioned as a saying, it's not always true. But what does the wife think? The wife thinks, oh, 
my husband is probably, why is he so late? It's at 12 o'clock, he's probably cheating on me. So even though this is a saying, but obviously my friends, there is no comparison between the love that a mother has, the compassion and the love that a spouse has. No one loves you like your mother. And I mentioned that in my past lecture. And no one can be compared to your parents. No one can be compared to your mother. In the last lecture, we spoke about the mothers in Karbala and how they sacrificed their children for Aba Abdullah al Hussein, how they had to witness their fruit of their lives, the joy of their eyes being slaughtered and massacred right in front of their eyes. But they did not hesitate because of their devotion, dedication, and love to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And amongst the mothers that sacrificed their ch child, that gave their beautiful child as a sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was Ar-Rabab, the mother of Abdullah al radi that little baby of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And this was probably one of the most difficult sacrifices of the mothers of Karbala because Abdullah al radi was a baby, a breastfeeding baby. It's so difficult when you see your child is sick, when your baby is sick, when your baby is in discomfort. And this is exactly what happened to Ar Rabab. Ar Rabab had reached a state where she could no longer look at the face of Abdullah. She could no longer look at the face of this little baby because he, he had no energy. He had no, absolutely no energy. He couldn't even cry. If you look at him, you, you, could, you, could, you, know, you could tell that this baby was going to die anyway because of malnourishment. You could tell he was going to die because of dehydration. And he could not even cry anymore. So she could not look at him in the face. And that's why Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when he came to farewell his family, he asked his sister Zainab to bring his little baby. So he farewells him. Zainab brought this little baby. Aba Abdullah al Hussein saw how he's in so much pain, suffering, about to die. Zainab asks him, my dear brother Hussein, take him to the enemies. Maybe they'll show him mercy and give him some water. Imam Hussein takes him to the enemies. He brings out the baby. He tells him, this is the only soldier I have left. He's a baby. His mother has no milk. He's dying of hunger and thirst. If you're afraid that I will take the water for me, you take him and give him the water. All of a sudden, Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, while he's waiting for the water to be given for his children, all of a sudden, the Imam, he notices a three-headed arrow that comes and pierces the neck of Ali, of Abdullah. It pierces him. The blood begins to gush everywhere. This little baby began to move his hands up and down. He was so afraid. He was telling his father, my dear father, I asked for water, but instead this is what they give me. They slaughter me in my neck. Imam Hussein carries the blood. He, he throws it towards the sky and he says, what gives me patience is that Allah is watching all this injustice. Allahu Akbar. And Imam al Hussein takes back the little baby. If they place him, they take him and they place him in the crib. Allah, her Rabab, how can she come and see her little baby, Abdullah Ali? She comes and she sees this little baby is covered in his blood. He has been slaughtered in his neck. Allahu Akbar, how much pain, suffering did Rabab have to go through just by looking at this child? And that's why they narrate that after Imam Hussein was killed, the 11th night of Muharram, Ar Rabab all of a sudden was missing. Zainab was looking after all the widows and the orphans. She notices Ar Rabab is missing. Where is Ar Rabab? She could not find her. She searches from tent to tent until she goes out in the desert between the bodies of the Shuhada of Karbala. She searches there. All of a sudden, she sees Ar Rabab. She is sitting all by herself alone. She tells her, Oh, Rabab, what are you doing? She notices Rabab is carrying something. Zainab looks. She sees it's a beheaded body that she's carrying. So Zainab asks Rabab, oh Rabab, what are you doing? Rabab tells her, Zainab, do not blame me. This is the, baby, the body of my baby, Abdullah al -Radi. Why have you come here? What are you doing with the body? She says, now that I drank water, I have milk. 
look, I have come to breastfeed my baby that died thirsty. <laughs> Zainab sees that she is trying to breastfeed the baby, but what's the problem? There is no head. How can you breastfeed a beheaded body of a baby? Because she had so much guilt, Ar-Rabab, that how did I allow my child to die thirsty? She wanted to console herself. My little baby, I have come to give you water now. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah, ya Mablum, ya Gharib, ya Shaheed. Ya Allah, brothers and sisters, let us raise our hands and supplicate to Allah and ask Him to bless us, to accept our a'mal, to give us the tawfiq and the ability that we can raise pious, righteous, mu'min, believing sons and daughters. Let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. Let us ask Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam to inspire us. Let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us so that we can maintain the rights of our children. Oh Allah, give us beautiful children that are mu'min, that are believing, that are pious. Oh Allah, we want, we ask you to give us the joy of our eyes and the comfort of our hearts from our children. Answer our hajat, answer our dua, cure all the sick ones, all the sick believers, all the mu'mineen and mu'minat that need our du'as, Ya Allah, grant them their hajat. Hasten the reappearance of the 12th Imam, make us amongst his companions and his supporters, and let us end by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha for all the mu'mineen and mu'minat that have departed us after a loud salawat for Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, imadik. Yes, sir.